Hello, it's Metacosis Perfection and is where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my neuroanatomy playlist. Today we're starting a new series talking about the cranial nerves. How many cranial nerves do you have? Answer. 12 pairs. The first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. Cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve. 3 is the oculomotor. 4 is the trochlear. 5 is the trigeminal. 6 is the abducens, which abducts. 7 is the facial. 8 is the auditory or vestibulocochlear or steatoacoustic nerve. 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve for your tongue and pharynx. 10 is the wanderer, vagus, it wanders all over your body. When we talk about the vagus nerve in a later video, I'll tell you about the story of the patient who had cough for 20 years and no doctor was able to find out why. What was the cause? There was a hair impacted inside his ear canal. It stimulated the vagus, the vagus stimulated the bronchi, the bronchi constricted, he coughed for 20 freaking years. See people, many problems can be solved if you do a thorough physical exam and if you know where to look. Cause medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the French toast you're talking about. 11 is the accessory nerve. Shrug your shoulder, look to the other side. And 12 is the hypoglossal nerve to move your tongue. Olfactory optic oculomotor, trochlear trigeminal abducens, facial auditory glossopharyngeal, vagus accessory hypoglossal. Did you know that when you go to a dirty public restroom, bathroom, and smell poop, you know how did this happen? Literal pieces of microscopic poop entered into your nasal cavity got stuck onto your nasal mucosa. But thankfully, the pieces of poop did not enter your brain. What entered is the nerve signal carried by the olfactory nerve. So when you say, quote, I am smelling poop, you mean it quite literally. Smash the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. Please watch the videos in my anatomy playlist in order. You'll find another video called Neuroanatomy. Some basics. Here's your brain. I want you to draw a line in the sand. Anything in front, motor. Anything behind, sensory. Of course, there are exceptions, but this is a good rule of thumb. For example, the frontal eye field moves the eye, so it is anterior. But the primary visual cortex feels the sensation that we call vision, so it's posterior as you see. If I want to move my fingers, primary motor cortex, anterior to this line. If I want to feel the feather touching my fingertips, this is posterior to the line. Let me talk, move my vocal cords, Broca's area, motor in front. But let me listen to you and understand you and make sense of what you're saying. That's Wernicke's area behind the line, motor in front sensory behind. The same story applies for the spinal cord. You draw the line in the sand. In front is motor, behind is sensory. Here are sensations going to the spinal cord and here are motor impulses leaving the spinal cord. Afferent, efferent, to, from. Your brain and spinal cord are central nervous system. Anything coming out of the brain or out of the spinal cord is peripheral nervous system. And here is a fact that is shocking to many students. All of your cranial nerves are peripheral nervous system. Oh, really? Not central? No, but they are in the skull. Skull is not part of the definition. The definition of central nervous system is brain and spinal cord, period, end of issue. Anything coming out of the brain or emerging out of the spinal cord, such as cranial nerves or spinal nerves, are peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system came from the neural tube during embryological development, whereas the peripheral nervous system came from the neural crest cells. And both the neural tube and the neural crest emerged from the neuroectoderm, which is part of the ectoderm. The nervous system is CNS and PNS, central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, cranial nerves and spinal nerves, 12 pairs and 31 pairs respectively. Next, gray matter versus white matter. You see this? This is the myelin sheath around my nerve. Myelin appears white in color. Myelin makes the neuron faster in conduction because I will jump, saltatory movements, faster conduction. But the gray matter means what? Means the neurons there do not have a myelin sheath. Let's look in the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, the gray matter is on the inside, which means 
unmyelinated fibers on the inside but on the outside what do we have we have myelinated white matter the exact opposite is true in the brain the central part is the white matter surrounded by the gray matter the central here white myelinated and the outer one unmyelinated because it's gray is that clinically significant of course it is Let's think of a demyelination disease where I lose my myelin. Oh, how about multiple sclerosis? It's a demyelination disease in the central nervous system. Where do you think we'll see the lesions in multiple sclerosis on MRI? Well, they have to be central because the myelin is central. The myelin is in the white matter. The damage is happening to the myelin. So the damage will happen to the white matter of the brain and you will see it inwards, not outwards. If you take a slice of your brain under magnetic resonance imaging, what are these called? These are called oligoclonal bands and you will find them on the inside, not on the periphery. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the French toast you're talking about. What's the structural unit of the nervous system? The neuron, of course. Here's the cell body and here's the axon. What's the functional unit? The reflex arc. Stimulus, sensory organ, afferent fiber, center, efferent fiber, effector organ, triggering a response. You can download these doozy handwritten notes on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. I help you understand and pass exams. Here is a soma, here is an axon. A collection of somas or cell body inside the central nervous system is called the nucleus. But a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system is called the ganglion. Does anyone remember the sympathetic ganglia? Paravertebral, prevertebral, etc. Even the adrenal medulla is a specialized ganglion and all of them are in the peripheral nervous system. Now there is an exception to this rule. Can you name a ganglion that is actually in the CNS and not the PNS? Please comment below. How about a collection of axons? In the CNS, it's called the tract, such as the optic tract, the olfactory tract that we'll talk about today. How about a collection of axons in the peripheral nervous system? It's a nerve, like the olfactory nerve, optic nerve, pudendal nerve, greater splanchnic nerve, etc. Another rule in neuro is motor is stuff that leaves the brain and goes somewhere else. Sensory is stuff that goes towards the brain. So when my brain tells my biceps muscle to move, that's motor. It started in the brain and goes towards the biceps. But when my fingertips feel the feather or the flame of the candle, these sensations will go from my fingertips towards my brain. So that's the sensory direction. Afferent efferent. My favorite part of the lecture, doodle with medicosis. Get a pencil and paper and let's go to town. Functions of your nervous system. Of course, we have sensory functions and we have motor functions. Okay, amazing. Let's classify them. Well, we can have somatic sensations, which is voluntary, and we have autonomic sensations, part of the involuntary autonomic nervous system. The same is true for motor functions. I have somatic motor and autonomic motor. Examples, when my fingertips feel the feather, that's a somatic sensation. But when my brain feels the drop in my blood pressure, which is something that I'm completely unaware of, this is an autonomic sensation. Conversely, when I move my biceps, this is a somatic movement. But when I squeeze my sweat gland to secrete sweat, that's an autonomic movement. There is another classification for sensory. We have two big types of sensation. There is general sensation and there is special sensation. What do you mean by special sensation? The five senses. All of them? No, just four of them. Vision, hearing, smell, taste. How about the touchy-touchy? No, touchy-touchy is general sensation. There are other general sensations, of course, but let's keep it simple. So the special sensations are hearing, vision, smell, and taste. And general sensation is touch. So today we're talking about the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve 1. Do you think it's sensory or motor? Well, it's called olfactory because it helps me smell. Smell is a sensation, not a movement. Thank you. So it's a sensory nerve. Bravo. 
Is it general sensory or special sensory? Well, since it's one of the four senses, smell, taste, vision, hearing, it is special sensory nerve. Amazing. How about the topic of the next video, which is the optic nerve? Do you think it is sensory or motor? Well, optic nerve helps me see. Seeing vision is a sensation. I'm not talking about moving my eye. I'm talking about seeing itself, the sensation of vision. That's a sensation. So it's a sensory nerve. Is it general sensory? Sensory or special sensory? It is special sensory. Amazing, this makes sense. Side note, the word autonomic is synonymous with the word visceral. So a visceral sensation is an autonomic sensation. Now there is some gibberish used by some professors that I absolutely detest. And it goes like this. I will use the orange color for sensory and I will use the red color for motor. First disaster is GSE. What the flip is this? This is general somatic efferent meaning motor how about gsa general somatic afferent it is general sensation because afferent means sensation so my fingertips feeling the feather is an example of gsa next we have jve general visceral efferent if it's efferent it's motor if it's visceral it's autonomic this is my nerve telling my gland to squeeze for example and we also have JVA, which is general visceral afferent. It's the autonomic sensation. Next, from the olfactory receptors and my taste bud, we have SVA, special visceral afferent for the special sensation. But for the eyes and ears, it is actually SSA, which is special sensory afferent. Cranial nerve 8 is one example. Then we have something weird called BE, branchial afferent. So I get efferent. Efferent means motor. But what is branchial? Do you remember the branchial arches or the pharyngeal arches? Oh yeah. The first arch was supplied by the trigeminal nerve. The second pharyngeal arch was supplied by the facial nerve. The third pharyngeal arch was supplied by the glossopharyngeal. The fourth and sixth arches are supplied by the vagus. Only those four cranial nerves can be called BE, branchial efferent. And last, we have something weird only for the inner ear, which is SSE which is special somatic efferent. I unequivocally denounce this system, but some professors like it. Another important doozy rule to help you understand neuroanatomy. Here is your forebrain, here is your midbrain, here's the pons, here's the middle. How many cranial nerves do we have? 12 pairs. Cranial nerve one and two come out of the forebrain. Three and four come out of the midbrain. Five, six, seven, eight come out of the pons. Nine, 10, 11, 12 are attached to the medulla. So it is two, two, four, four. Four mid pons medulla, two, two, four, four. You cannot afford to forget this. Many questions on your exam will be answered if you simply understand this table. Now I said that cranial nerve one and two come out of the forebrain, which is the olfactory nerve and the optic nerve. If you wanna be super duper sophisticated about it, the forebrain consists of two parts. One is the telencephalon on the outside, and one is the diencephalon, which is deep. Dian is deep on the inside. Cranial nerve one, which is the olfactory, is attached to the telencephalon. But cranial nerve two, which is the optic nerve, is attached to the diencephalon. We can abbreviate cranial nerves. For example, instead of saying olfactory nerve, you can simply write down cranial nerve one in Roman numerals cranial nerve number one. How about this? This is cranial nerve number 12. That's the number. What's the name? Hypoglossal nerve. The three brain vesicles during embryological development, remember that the CNS came from the neural tube. Here is the upper part of the neural tube, meaning rostral, not caudal. We have three vesicles, one, two, and three. The first one is the prosencephalon, or the forebrain. Second one is the mesencephalon or the midbrain. By the way, the word meso literally means mid. So whenever you hear mesencephalic, mesocortical, meso whatever, meso means midbrain. If you remember organic chemistry, what is a meso compound? It was mid because it had an internal plane of symmetry right smack in the middle like this. Oh, it is mid, meso compound. See, medicine and chemistry make perfect sense if you know what you're talking about. So the mesencephalon is going to give me midbrain. Then we have the rhombencephalon or the hindbrain. This is for the metencephalon, pons and cerebellum. And the myelencephalon. Remember the word myelo means what? It means the core. What's in the core of your vertebral column spinal cord? 
cord. What's the continuation of the spinal cord as you go upstairs? The medulla. So the medulla is the myelin. Anything else is the metin. That's how I remember it, by understanding what the word literally means. Myelo means core. It could be the core of your vertebral column, i.e. the spinal cord, or the core of your bone, i.e. the bone marrow. Does anyone remember myelofibrosis? How about myeloid stem cells? How about myelothesis? What about myelodysplasia? What about acute myeloid leukemia? Stuff happening in the bone marrow, which is in the core of the bone. The marrow is in the core of the bone, and the spinal cord slash medulla is in the core of the vertebral column. The medulla is a continuation of the spinal cord. As for the forebrain, it divides into telencephalon and diencephalon. Telencephalon will give me the cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia. The diencephalon will give me anything that has the word thalamus in it, such as thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, and subthalamus. In the good old day, which were not so good, we also had the metathalamus. Today we're talking about cranial nerve number one, and in the next video we're talking about cranial nerve number two. Let me tell you, cranial nerve one is going to end up on the telencephalon. As for cranial nerve 2, it will pass by the diencephalon. How about 3 and 4, midbrain? How about 5, 6, 7, 8, pawns, please? How about 9, 10, 11, 12, medulla? Don't forget 11 is accessory because it took an accessory piece from the spinal cord. You want a cool tip? Look at olfactory nerve. It went straight to the telencephalon, not to the diencephalon. And that's why you will learn later that the thalamus is a relay station for all the sensations except smell. Here is my forebrain or prosencephalon. It's gonna give me telencephalon and diencephalon. The diencephalon is deep on the inside and it has everything that contains thalamus. As for the telencephalon, it will divide into the dorsal part known as the pallium, hence paleocortex, and ventral telencephalon, sub pallium. Which one is on the outside? The, the dorsal, of course, the cerebral cortex. Which one is deeper? That's the basal ganglia. Nervous system, somatic and autonomic. The somatic is what you can control. It has motor, it has sensory. The autonomic is involuntary. You cannot control. It also has motor and sensory. When I say that this nerve is mixed, it means it's motor and sensory and maybe even autonomic. It has more than one function. All of the spinal nerves are mixed. Today's nerve, which is the olfactory nerve, is purely sensory. It is special visceral afferent. Remember that autonomic is made of sympathetic, parasympathetic, and don't forget your gut, enteric nerve system. You can learn about all of them in my physiology playlist. Recall that sympathetic nervous system is thoracolumbar, but the parasympathetic nervous system is craniosacral. So when we talk about cranial nerves, what are the autonomic ones? Only four of them, cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9, and 10. How do I remember it? Think of the year 1973. Oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and this is not one, this is a 10, vagus. These are the only cranial nerves that do possess autonomic function, parasympathetic function to be specific. As for the sympathetic, it does not emerge from the brain, only thoracolumbar spinal cord. Now to the big boy, olfactory nerve or cranial nerve number one. By using the classification that I despise, olfactory nerve is SVA. It is special because it's smell, special senses. It is afferent because it's sensory and it is visceral. It's a special sensory nerve that carries smell or olfaction sensation from nasal mucosa to the forebrain. Be more specific. I started on the receptors at the olfactory mucosa at the roof of your nasal cavity. And then what? Are you just one fiber? No, we are 20 bundles that travel through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Very important. On either side, there is an olfactory nerve on your right. There is one on your left, right and left olfactory nerves. And then we end on the olfactory bulb on the brain. There is also one on the right and one on the left. Hey, olfactory nerve or olfactory nerve fibers, are you myelinated? No, we're not myelinated. But are you surrounded by meninges? Yes, indeed. Dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater, you name it. We do have meninges around us. Doodle with medicosis, cranial nerve one, let's go. Here is my lovely nose. On the roof of my nose, what do I have? I have olfactory epithelium, specialized epithelium for smelling. 
okay. Between those epithelial cells, we do have the beginnings of the olfactory nerve, just like that. Here's an axon this way, and then we have a cell body. After the cell body, what do we have? We have another axon. What's the name of the cell that has one axon here, one axon there? One pole here, another pole there. Oh, it's a bipolar neuron. Bingo. And this is the soma or the cell body of this bipolar neuron. Now what? We will pierce the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, which will make us leave your nasal cavity and enter into your cranial cavity. Where will you end? On the olfactory bulb. Which part of the olfactory bulb? I am glad you asked. We will actually synapse on cells in the olfactory bulb known as mitral cells, also neurons. Since we're talking sensory neurons, we are going towards the brain. What is that big bulge called? It is the olfactory bulb. And then the continuation is called olfactory tract. And there you have it. Here is my nasal mucosa, roof of my nose. Embedded between them are fibers of the olfactory nerve fibers. Olfactory nerve is not just one fiber. We have about 20 bundles. Each bundle consists of bipolar neurons. When I smelled poop in the nasty public restroom, pieces of poop literally dislodged and went to my nose and onto the mucosal cells. They are felt by the mucosal cells. And then they are translated from something mechanical and chemical, which is the pieces of poop, into something electrical and chemical, which is the nerve impulse. Now the nerve impulse will go to my brain. The actual pieces of poop do not go to your brain. They remain in your nose until your nasal secretions clear them. As for the nerve impulse, you remember the voltage-gated sodium channels, the leaky potassium channels, and the voltage-gated potassium channels, and all of this nonsense. All of this is implicated here. And we will carry the nerve impulse from the olfactory fibers to the mitral cell inside the olfactory bulb. Olfactory bulb will continue as the olfactory tract, which will reach the telencephalon, which is part of the prosencephalon. Smell is the only sensation that does not relay in the thalamus. If anatomy might sound boring, clinically oriented anatomy is never boring. Let's take it to the clinic. We'll talk about myocor and rhizopus, which are fungi. We'll talk about Negleria foliae, a human parasite. We'll talk about Kalman syndrome and anterior cranial fossa fracture. Why did I choose these organisms specifically? Because these organisms can actually reach my nose and then invade the brain through the crib reform plate of the ethmoid bone. Here's a question for you. What are the different parts of the ethmoid bone? Please comment below. Mucor and rhizobus are sometimes referred to by the public as the black fungus because it can lead to a black scar on my face. The organisms mucor and rhizobus. The disease mucor mycosis. Osis means condition. That's why the name of my channel is Medicosis Perfectionalis. It's a condition of perfect medicine, as you can tell. Muco means fungus. Mycology is the science that studies fungus. Mycotic aneurysm is an infected aneurysm. It doesn't have to be fungus, it could be bacterial, but forgive them. They did not know what they were doing. As for mucor, that's the name of the fungus. Mucor and rhizobus. Fungus with wide-angled, broad, non-septate, irregular hyphae. It is mold only, it's not a yeast. If I inhale the spore and I am immunocompromised, the fungus will actually proliferate onto my vessel wall. Not just that, it can actually enter the brain after causing an escar formation on my face. Then it invades vessels. Then it invades the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Then it's in the brain. It can lead to cerebral abscess or brain abscess. It can lead to frontal headache and facial pain. And it can keep digging until it causes cavernous sinus syndrome. It can even affect my cranial nerves. As for this escar, it's on the face, but it also could be on the palate as well. Why was I immunocompromised? Could be diabetic ketoacidosis, uncontrolled diabetes, neutropenia, leukemia, immunodeficiency, whether inherited or acquired. Inherited as in severe combined immunodeficiency, acquired such as HIV AIDS or if I'm taking an immunosuppressive medication. The SCAR is black necrotic tissue, hence the name black fungus. How do you treat an SCAR? Remove its surgical debris known as escarotomy. SCAR removal. 
Medical management including antifungal medications, usually by injection, such as amphotericin B and isavuconazole. What's the mechanism of action of amphotericin B? What's the mechanism of action of this azole? Please comment below. Another clinically significant syndrome is Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome is a genetic disease where I'm born with two big problems. The first problem is that my GnRH cells did not migrate to the hypothalamus which means the hypothalamus cannot make GnRH, which means the pituitary cannot make FSH and LH, which means my testicle cannot make testosterone. If I'm a man, I get low sperm count, oligospermia. If I'm a female, I get amenorrhea. I don't get it. If the problem is in the male hormone, why do females suffer? Because remember that the female hormone, estrogen, came from the male hormone, androgen, by an enzyme known as aromatase. That was my first problem. My second problem is a defect in the olfactory bulb. Without the olfactory bulb, say goodbye to olfaction. So now I cannot smell. And osmia. And means no, osmia means smell. I can smell and I can't reproduce is the sad story of Kalman syndrome. Another clinically important topic is anterior cranial fossa fracture. If I fracture my anterior cranial fossa, which contains the olfactory bulb, I can actually sever and detach the olfactory nerve from the olfactory bulb which will lead to loss of sense of smell. Moreover, don't forget that cranial nerve number one was surrounded by meninges, dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater. And what's the name of the fluid that's under the arachnoid in the subarachnoid space? Cerebrospinal fluid. Oh, so after that fracture, I can actually lose cerebrospinal fluid through my nose a condition known as CSF rhinorrhea. Rhino means nose, rhea means flow, as in diarrhea, menorrhea. And I have a video titled Basler Skull Fracture, which we talked about the different signs and symptoms that happen to me if I fracture my skull, especially the base of the skull. One of the signs was cerebrospinal fluid rhinorrhea. If you want to learn more about amphotericin B, the azole antifungal medications, terbanafin, griseofolvin, the antibacterial medications, the antiviral medications and the antiparasitic medications, download my antibiotics course on my website medicosisperfectionatus.com. It comes with videos, cases, questions and answers and my perfectionatus ultimate notebook. We use iscarotomy for mucormycosis and we use fasciotomy for compartment syndrome. If you want to learn more about compartment syndrome, the different types of shock, trauma surgery, orthopedic surgery and much more, download my surgery high yields course on my website, medicosisperfectionated.com. There are more than 300 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.